To close out our program, as I've mentioned, today I'm very pleased to welcome the Under Secretary General of the UN and Executive Director of the UN Environment Program. Inger Anderson has more than three decades of experience in international development, economics, and environmental sustainability, specializing in the Middle East and Northern Africa. She's normally in Nairobi. I think she's in Copenhagen right now. Uh, Madam Under Secretary General, it's really great to see you. One time I moderated a forum uh, kind of looking at the, seven, the next 75 years of the United Nations. And I had something like six or seven undersecretaries and the president of the council and Ban Ki-moon. Uh, there were about nine people on the panel. We got it done in an hour. But I did not have you. I would have loved to have spent the whole hour with you. So tell us, um, you know, I, you, you have a very interesting role and job, which is really to be the conscience of the world when it comes to thinking about how the world can do better on environment. What are the highest priorities you have? I know water is one. Tell us about that. But what are some of the agenda items right now of your office? Well, at this time, and thank you for having me, Steve. It's a pleasure. And just call me Inga, please. That's much great, better. Great. At any rate, uh, so um, at this time when we really, and, and this, this show, of course, is focusing on climate change, which is an existential crisis. We're mm. talking about three planetary crises in the context of the United Nations, the climate crisis, the nature crisis, and the pollution and waste crisis. And why do we have these crises? What has happened to bring them about? It is us, it is the human beings. It is our unsustainable consumption, our unsustainable production. We take stuff out of the environment, we mm. put it into the economy, that's a fine thing. But then we discard it back into the environment as CO2 emissions, as waste, as, dis as, uh, as destroyed forest, as lost species. And we are assuming that harvest will follow harvest, that rain will come when it's supposed to come, that the tides will be as they are, that the fish will be where they've always come, that the migratory uh, birds will be where they are, and that pollinators will pollinate our crops. We're assuming that what we refer to as the Earth systems will remain stable. And that assumption is quite something because at this point, we've put more carbon into the atmosphere than we've seen in 800,000 uh, years. And so uh, we've, in these last uh, 3 million years, we've seen temperature differences on two degrees only. Now that's extraordinary because we've had the ice age and everything else, but two degrees. So what is that then? when today we know that we are at 1.2 degrees already and we want to keep it at 1.5. That is the story here. So yes, the three crises, climate, nature, and, and, and pollution and waste. But right now, obviously all eyes are on climate and that's of course what your show right now is also about. Right. And, and, and I've heard, well, I, 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 was, I was sort of listening to some of the other talk yeah. and there's, I mean, tremendous amount of, um, of, of energy now in this topic, I think. So I really do thank you for, for pushing it out there in, in Washington, no, D.C. over uh, at this time. I think it's, it's my privilege, my honor to do that with you, but I, I also really appreciate the synergy of these challenges as you talked about them. And I'm gonna go ahead to a question we got because we have the former Secretary of Agriculture, uh, who's a good friend, Dan Glickman, um, oh. who, who sent a note to me and he said, Steve, and he wanted me to pose this, he says, over 70% of the world's fresh water is used today to irrigate crops and feed animals. If, uh, it's even higher in the developing world. Imagine that only 30% then is left for the world's, of the world's water for everything else. Dramatic w weather changes are heightening the drought food, uh, food flood cycle worldwide, and this will all affect the ability to feed the world sustainably. So, you know, I'm interested in, you know, this is another dimension, which I think fits into your, your construct, but I, I think that sometimes people, you know, we, we saw what happened in Cape Town, South Africa. We see that cities can run into this. We know that water is part of the equation there. But in terms of the moving picture, I guess my question is, what do we need to do to not only get grassroots understanding of there, but to get governments to take action to preempt some of these nightmare scenarios, uh, such as Dan just shared? I mean, uh, obviously, first of all, we need to take climate action because part of why we're seeing these increasing droughts, part of why we understand that those areas that are already arid will in all likelihood, based on, IP, uh, based on science projections, be uh, experiencing greater and more frequent droughts um, and therefore be under even greater stress. 
So we need to deal with climate now. But at the same time, and as the uh, secretary uh, asked, um, obviously we have countries that are in extreme water stress right now. And, and we need to understand uh, that that is uh, something that we then need to think about. How is it? Is it because we have destroyed um, the uh, surrounding environment and therefore are there ways that we can mediate and remediate that? Yes, to an extent, because a local hydrological cycle has been disrupted due to uh, desertification and land degradation. So there is an opportunity, therefore, to restore land, to restore ecosystems to a degree. These are still arid lands. I'm not talking about the complete aridity, but the, 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 the agricultural lands of uh, Iraq and Syria and Jordan and Yemen. Now, they have been destroyed due, due to obviously conflict, etc., due to over extraction. And, and due to lack of management and so on. But also, if we, went, if we can uh, regenerate, and, and Americans know this from the Dust Bowl. American know, Americans know that you can bring, uh, or from Tennessee Valley, as an example, mm. you can bring a, a degraded and uh, destroyed um, uh, lands back to life. But it takes uh, some investments and it takes stability. So... At the same time, we need to be sure that we don't over extract from the groundwater resources. And that's a real problem because we tend to over extract when we don't have the rains um, and if we do not have enough storage. And of course, there's a global issue around food and this is uh, that we waste so much food. Uh, if food was if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest emitter on this hmm. good earth. So thinking about how we deal, store, move and and ensure that food is used and not wasted. And then, of course, thinking about water use efficiency. How much crop per drop are we producing? Mm. How much evaporation is there? Can we do drip irrigation? These are some of the answers that we need to tackle. I, I very much liked uh, my last guest commenting from you know Egypt. Sarah said, don't underestimate indigenous innovation in this area, which I think is a very important point. But I also know that part of the big challenge is to get the big population, big landmass countries aligned. And so those would be, I mean, I'll, I'll just make, you know, solve Europe's problems. Let's just call Europe a country. Uh, the United States, Brazil, uh, India, China. And I'll ask you the unfair question, which I know you can't do, which is to grade each of them on how much they're <laughs> leaning in on this. But because but, I know you can't answer that. Let me ask, what opportunities do you see in a Brazil or you know, what frustrations do you see when it comes to getting the world's biggest landmass, largest population countries aligned? Because that will create surround sound with a lot of the other nations in the world, I, I suspect. Look, uh, I mean, look, we are not living in a in a in a world where everybody is in agreement, right? Mm. So there, but corner solutions is not going to get us anywhere, uh, anywhere. And and what we need to understand is that climate change is coming. You know, if we thought COVID was bad, climate change is so much worse. <laughs> COVID is a little overture compared to that complete disruption of the Earth systems as we know it. So. Um, what is really good is that the U.S. is coming back in in a leadership position from at the political level. I will say, though, large parts of the U.S. economy never left Paris. Many states did not leave Paris. Many companies did not leave Paris and certainly many citizens did not. Um, and of course, we need to understand this at the same time that um, the issue of equity is real. Right. Uh, very poor countries are very hydrocarbon dependent. And how are we going to support them? We can't just say, look, you uh, 600 million Africans don't have access at all to mm. electricity. Too bad you can't use if you're sitting on a pile of hydrocarbons. You can't say that unless we treat this with solidarity, which is why uh, climate finance was part of the deal, is part of the deal. You've got to help these countries get energy uh, online and 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 use that to leapfrog into the non-polluting mm. age of energy. And when it comes to tropical forest and your reference to to either the Congo Basin, to Indonesia, to Brazil, clearly these are the lungs of the of the earth, right? But at the same time, you have very poor people living in some of these basins. 
And again, we need to have solidarity. We need to support these countries. We cannot sit back and say, well, we just want you to make sure that these forest stands remain and uh, so that we, we uh, live fine and dandy in our big cities. We've got to think with these poor, poorer nations how we can support them. And I think that that's a conversation we are having. And certainly that's what we need to see uh, at Glasgow, where at this time, what we need to see, we've got 126 countries uh, that are signed up for net zero. That means that by 2050, they will have net zero emissions. But even with that, and even on the assumption mm. that the U.S. comes into the net zero club, which has been part of President right. Biden's election platform, we will still be at 3.5 to 3 uh, to 2.5 to 2.6 degrees. So we got to stretch. We got to stretch. And that's what uh, Glasgow has to be. We need to go further, faster with clear time marked uh, uh, actions. Inger, real, real quick, last question. You know, we have today, we've been looking at, you know, new technologies developed in the Middle East, you know, Israel, UAE, other countries. Are they on the map? Can they make a difference in the climate change story? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, um, Israel has done some really great work on um, precision agriculture, precision irrigation. We heard the UAE, they've, they've, they've built a whole new city. They started companies mm. uh, and they're really seeking to lean in. Now, they are a hydrocarbon dependent economy, but they have also seen and, and I think we heard that from, from Senator Whitehouse. Um, look, these are, coal was the first sunset sector, but other sun, hydrocarbon sectors are coming. So diversification matters and matters greatly so that we leave no one behind. And, and that's part of what we need to do. So yes, there are real solutions. And aridity does not mean necessarily right. that you cannot diversify, have extraordinary economies, reach for literally Mars. Um, and so I think that it is all about innovation and re-engineering the thinking because we do not have the steam engine anymore. We do right. not have, uh, I mean, we are moving forward and using technology will be part and parcel of the solution. Well, Under Secretary General of the United Nations, Inger Anderson, uh, uh, Executive Director of the UN Environment Program. You know, I'm hoping to try to figure out how to get over to Glasgow or around there. You know, one of these things happen. So maybe we'll be able to meet in person. But thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. And thank you for your leadership. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. That brings us to the end of our program today. A very big thank you to the Embassy of the United Arab Emirates in Washington, D.C. for its support of this program and these conversations, and all of you in the audience for joining us. For those of you who missed any of the conversations, we'll have all of this up on our, on our website shortly. Uh, you can check them all out there. They're worth it. I'm Steve Clemens. Be well.